not every room is meant for us, right? And so often we're, we're actually contributing to the trauma by trying to make it work at these places that are never going to accept us. And just like any relationship, um, you gotta know when to fold them, right? If it's not serving you, <laughs> if everything is a battle, um, then know that you belong in every space, but not every space deserves to have you. Hey family, I'm Minda Hartz and you're doing life with Lakeisha on Living Her Truth. Hey family, welcome to the Living Her Truth podcast where we have honest conversations about what it means to live a purpose-driven life. I am your host, Lakeisha Wooder from LakeishaWooder.com, the place where women receive the tools necessary to feel seen, heard, and supported while pursuing their purpose. And now every week you'll learn those same tools through candid and transparent conversations. Hey family, welcome to another episode. I am so excited that you're out here. I do not take it lightly that you decide to hit that play button and spend about an hour of your time with me. So with that being said, I want you to know that I'm 100% invested in your self-awareness journey. So you better believe that every week I'm bringing my A game for providing you the tools necessary to live a more fulfilled, purpose-driven life. So family, I want to remind you to please take a moment to leave a five-star rating and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Because as you know, I set a lofty goal to touch one million hearts within the first two years. And I can only do it with your help. So please remember to download each episode, share the conversation with at least four people you know, and repost on your favorite social media platform. Also, don't forget to click the join community link that's in the show notes so we can stay connected and continue the conversation. Now, today is week eight in our Strategize Your Vision series. And in case this is your first time listening to the Living Our Truth podcast, the series starts at episode 54. Now, this series is based on my master life class, Strategize Your Vision, which I teach you the step-by-step formula for building a rock-solid strategy to manifest your vision. And let me tell you something, party people! Let me tell you something. (laughs) Today's conversation is going to be good. Real talk. This is going to be good. And I know I say this with every, every episode, but no, for real, for real, this is going to be good. I've been... So excited about this conversation to drop ever since I confirmed her um, podcast interview last October. You have no idea how many times I had rewrote and started over her questions over and over and over again because I want to make sure that you get the most out of our conversation today. You have no idea, like I take it seriously when I bring people here on a podcast to have a conversation with us because I want to make sure that you are pulling value from every episode. Now, let me put you up on game for a second, just in case you've been living up under a rock, okay? Or if you of the lighter skin tone, let me put you up on game. Black women are hot right now. People of color in general are hot right now because organizations are starting to see the importance of having diversity and being equitable and inclusive in their organizations. And from some of you, this is not new. You already knew that we were hot in these streets, but maybe don't quite know how to handle the situation as it is right now. Well, guess what? We're going to talk about it today. Okay, shall we talk about it today? Because we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about a family with Minda Hearts. Yes, the Minda Hearts, the author of the memo. Plus, we're going to talk about navigating corporate politics, obviously, because it's Minda Heart, right? We're going to talk about navigating corporate politics. But more importantly, we're going to talk about the connection between how you advocate for yourself in your personal life, how that impacts your self-advocacy on a professional level. Family, I am so glad that I put in the level of work to prepare for this conversation the way that I did. Because not only was I able to extract so much valuable information for you, 
and you know so many actionable steps that you can implement starting today but i was also able to validate my next move in my business i had the opportunity to talk about my next move with minda and i'm so thankful for it and you'll get to hear all about it in the conversation today but before we jump into it let me formally introduce you to minda Minda Hearts is the CEO of The Memo LLC, a career development platform for women of color. She is the best-selling author of The Memo, What Women of Color Need to Know to Secure a Seat at the Table. Minda is an assistant professor at NYU Wagner. She has been featured on MSNBC's Morning Joe, Fast Company, The Guardian, and Time Magazine. Minda frequently speaks at companies like Microsoft, Levi's, Google, and Bloomberg on topics such as leadership, managing diverse teams, and self-advocacy. She also hosts a weekly podcast called Secure the Seat. You guys, if you don't go ahead and get your pen and your paper right now, you're going to be sorry that you didn't. But please enjoy as you eavesdrop on my conversation with my new friend, Minda Hartz. Minda, thank you so much for saying yes to having this conversation with me today. There was no other answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, thank you. Thank you. You're about to bring tears to my eyes already. I told you, I just started my year yesterday. <laughs> thank you so much. I am like super excited for, for this conversation. And I know I say that you guys for every episode that's because I just I love what I do number one I love speaking to people and I have some amazing people that I talk to so of course I'm going to be excited about this podcast episode but uh Minda I like to start off every conversation with just talking about how I come to know my guests and so this episode is no different and I want to do the same with you so um <laughs> So here on the podcast, at the end of every episode, I always ask for an Audible or a book recommendation because I'm addicted to Audible and I love to read, you know, personal development and self-help books. That's just something that I that I love to do. So I always, you know, ask my guests what book would they recommend and somebody recommended the memo. Hey family, quick announcement. If you're ready to go deeper and would love to continue the conversation, outside the podcast, then I have something just for you. I'm creating a safe, judgment-free community of like-minded people to grow and build the support team that we need to operate in purpose. If you want to join me, please visit livinghertruthpodcast.com and then click the join community button so we can partner together on your self-awareness journey. I am looking forward to getting to know each and every one of you. I am so excited to deep dive into your purpose and we're going to have such a great time, you guys. I look forward to seeing you in the group. Now, back to the conversation. And I had never even heard of you or your book before then. And so she said that it was a really, you know, great book. I guess I, I said I was going to research which episode it was, but I but I didn't. But she said the memo was a great book for really just guiding, you know, through corporate America, you know, guide through corporate politics, you know. And so I was just like, okay, well, let me write that down. I was like, is it on Audible? And she was like, yes, yeah, on Audible. So I was like, okay, I wrote it down. I was like, I'm check it out. And I listened to your book. I probably listened to that book probably in, in a day and a half. <laughs> like I took every moment I could to listen to the book. And it was amazing. It is amazing. I have so many bookmarks in my Audible. So I'm just like, man, I would love to be able to ask her this. And I love to be able to ask her that. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to shoot my shot. I'm going to shoot my shot. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little research see if I can find an email address or something. I'm going to shoot my shot. And I did. And now you're here. And I am stoked. I'm, I'm, I'm hyped about this because how often do I, do people get interviews with the authors? You're my first author of a book that was recommended here on the podcast. You're the first person for me to, to interview. Wow. Wow. Well, <laughs> shout out to that uh, guests for putting putting the memo on your radar. So this is awesome. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
I'm, I'm excited. So let's start off with um, talking about what caused you to become a disruption in corporate America. Because sis, you disrupted corporate America with the memo, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah de definitely. Uh, <laughs> it, you know, it was one of those things, Lakeisha, where I was, I was living my best life on paper in corporate America, right? You know, I was making the money that I always dreamed to make and all of these different things. But at the end of the day, I was still experiencing racism. I was still experiencing those, you know, just being the only one, the isolation, all of the things that many of us tend to feel when we're in many of these dominant majority uh, white workplaces. And I start, I was going through so many different things and I realized that I started to lose myself because I was always walking on eggshells. I was always thinking about, you know, I don't want anybody to think of I'm to this or I'm doing that or, and, and you just, you can't be, people say, bring your authentic self to work, but black women rarely get the opportunity to bring their full selves to work. And I started to think about my legacy in the workplace, right? What am I doing to make the workplace better for us women who look like me? Cause nobody's thinking about us in those ways, right? <laughs> you know, they talk about women, but typically they mean white women. And so for me, I just really started grappling with how can I make the workplace better for black women, for women of color? And I realized that it would cause a disruption, right? And I was willing to take that risk because I was hoping that so many more people would benefit from me taking that stance. You know what? Thank you. Thank you for taking that stance because, you know, as a, as a black woman, you know, who worked in corporate America, I too walked on eggshells. Now I'm the type of person, you guys, I'm very laid back. I'm very, you know, goofy here on the podcast. I like to laugh and have a good time with, with my guests, but in the workplace, like I'm all about business, not to the point where I wasn't personable because I was personable to the people that, that I manage, but I was all about business. But for whatever reason that came across as I don't know, something, something else. So if, you know, I look funny like, like this or something, you know, it's just like, oh, it's okay, Keisha, it's okay. Don't need to get upset. And I'm like, I'm not getting upset. It's like, I can't even like do this, put my hand to the side. And, and you know, it, it was just, it's like, oh my goodness. So you're going to just immediately label me as the angry black woman. Like I can't even like show any type of emotion at all. Like I got to be this stone one way type of person. So yeah, I, I completely get it, which is why I related to your book so much, you know, and I love the fact that you share a lot of what you experience in the workplace. Cause I'm pretty transparent about my personal experience as well through my business and here on a podcast. So that was another thing that drew me to your book. Cause you, you know, you, you didn't name no names, <laughs> but if they read the book, they knew who you was talking about. <laughs> they, they, they knew girl, they knew. I had a couple old coworkers reach out and they were like, was that so-and-so you were talking about? I was like, you know it was. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. But but I loved it because, you know, it's, you know, sometimes depending on a situation, you know, you don't need to, it's probably not good to share the details. But my thing is share, especially when it comes to something like this, because there has been things that happen in the office that I wonder like, okay, am, am I like, am I, are my feelings valid? Was that kind of, that kind of felt kind of icky, but am I tripping? Because as a black woman, you know, and, and people is like, oh, you know, I'm colorblind, racism don't, don't exist or whatever. I'm kind of skeptical on what, what happens, things that, that were icky that happened that make me feel like, you know, was that racist or whatever? Make me question it. So you sharing these experiences help me to be like, okay, I want crazy. And that's the thing, right? Like we, because we're in these environments so long for so many years, we no longer, we just settle into it, right? We're like, this is what it's going to be like for us. And, um, and I really wanted to be able to hold corporate America, any industry really, and say, hey, how you, how many of you have been treating um, Black women is unacceptable, right? You know, <laughs> and our careers, our feelings, they matter. And most importantly, our mental health, because doing that, you know, I, I spent 15 years in corporate America and I think about how much racialized trauma 
I was subjected to, you know, it does change you a little bit, you know, and I, and I don't want that for, for us, but I don't want that for the next generation either. Yeah. And I'm glad you used that word trauma. Cause I was going to ask you that. Do you think that's considered a trauma? Because here on the podcast, we talk about, you know, all different types of trauma because the trauma that I talk about personally a lot is sexual abuse. Right. But I know that that's not everybody's story, but maybe you, you know, experience racism in corporate America. That's a traumatic experience. You know, I wanted to ask you that. Do you consider that to be, you know, to be traumatic? And it's like, it is. Anything that negatively impacts you and cause you to deviate from your purpose is, is traumatic. Yeah, I mean, you hit it on the head. Uh, and I think that's what I hope we talk even more about because a lot of people don't look at racism as trauma, right? But that causes anxiety. It causes, um, you know, your decline fine in mental health, depression, all the things. And when you're subjected to that and then told, oh, you're taking it the wrong way, just go back and do it. It's like a, any abusive relationship, right? You know, I, I'm being harmed, rather you want to admit it or not. Now you're telling me just go work under that manager, just go work with that colleague. And, and I really want, especially in 2021 and beyond, is to really normalize that it's not okay. Any trauma in the workplace is not okay because you would say, oh, Jim is sexually harassing Jane. And, and we would see that as a problem. But when it happens to black women, verbal racialized uh, assault, oh, that's just Jim being Jim. It's like, no, no Jim is problematic. Let's talk about it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Let's talk about it. And, and I love how you called it, you know, a, a, a relationship at work because you guys, we have to, we have to understand that we are one person who you are at home is the same person that shows up at work and who you are at work is the same person that you take when you go home at night so what you experiencing at work please don't don't think that it's not affecting how you show up in your personal life because it is you are the same person and whatever is going on in your home life is going to affect you know your your work life which is why you know we having this conversation through doing my strategize your vision series and the reason why i want to have minda on the podcast is because i wanted to bridge the gap between the two because that's the old saying never mix you know business with pleasure and I, you know what i'm working to eradicate that because again we are one person there is no way somebody can walk you know, to the office door. And before they walk over that threshold, be like, okay, I'm my business self. Everything that happened at home, I'm not bringing, to, I'm not bringing it to the office. Stop it. It's going, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So if you're not sticking up for yourself at home, nine times out of 10, you're probably not going to stick up for yourself at work either. Yeah. And you know, when we don't <clears throat> acknowledge that these traumas are taking place in our life, as you know, mm -hmm. it, it starts to deteriorate us and um, and then we don't recognize ourselves. We don't. And then we start to question, am I the reason this is happening? Right. All of the things like any other that. So it's any type of trauma is insidious, racial, sexual, you know, verbal. It It is all take, trying to take away someone's dignity. Right. And like you said, stopping them from their purpose. And I think as black women, just generations, it's that generations of trauma you know, and in all kinds of ways. And, and we really have to talk about the workplace because I feel um, it just can't go on anymore, right? It's just, we mm -hmm. can't live that type of life. We can't be traumatized in every walk of life, right? There has to be some peace. It has to be, it has to be some peace. And in order to have that peace, healing needs to, healing needs to take place as well. You know, um, growing up in, in the hood, like I said, I was sexually abused and I grew up in the hood right outside of Chicago. Like, you know, I had to go through therapy and heal to like um, shed that angry layer. So I don't take it into the workplace, you know, because unresolved trauma, you're going to take that into a workplace too. Because I mean, Yes, racism does does exist, does exist. But some of y'all, y'all are causing havoc in a workplace. Let's be real. Some of y'all, y'all causing havoc, and it's probably because of that unresolved trauma. You have to you have to get the healing so you can have the peace that Minda was was talking about. You know. So, um, but Minda, you you also say uh, that we need to secure the seat at the table. 
What does that mean to secure the seat to, to, to secure a seat at the table? What does that mean? And why should, you know, black women, women of color, why should we even concern ourselves with securing a seat at the table? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm glad you asked that because it's not just about the seat, right? You know, we often hear a seat at the table and it's not just about the seat, but it's about creation, ownership, about legacy building. If we're not in these rooms, uh, then we aren't advancing the agenda. There's nobody there to talk about the things that would be helpful to women of color, black women in the workplace, right? So it's not enough to just have a seat at the table and just be grateful for that seat, just to be in the room, right? Looking cute. No, what are you going to do with that seat, right? And are you bringing other women that look like you in the room, right? Because success is not just for us. I, I often say that success is not a solo sport. So if you get in the room, what are you doing to make it better for the next woman that joins you, the next Black woman that joins you. And so for me, I think for too long, and, and Mrs. Michelle Obama often says it, many of us are too grateful just sitting at the table to shake it up, right? When you get in the room, they invited you to be there. So, you know, what are you going to do uh, to make sure that our interests um, as Black women are being advanced, right? And so for me, securing your seat has to start in the mind first, right? Audre Lorde said, beware of feeling like you're not good enough to deserve it. You deserve to be in the places and the spaces that you want to be, but maybe they don't deserve to have you in those spaces, all right? So secure your seat or build your seat, build your table in the spaces that you can grow. And I think that we just have to start to redefine success by our own terms, uh, because let's be honest, corporate America is not thinking about us. They, did, they were never thinking about us being in that room, right? So, but now we're coming for their seats, we're being in these spaces and what are we gonna do when we get the seat, right? Doesn't matter why they gave it to you. Like in the last year, you know, a lot of promotions have been happening and a lot of black women will say, well, I think they gave it to me because I'm, you know, because of the George Floyd situation. It's like, you probably, you should have probably had that seat a long time ago. Don't think about that, right? Now it's like, what are you gonna do now that you got it? Like, don't entertain those thoughts because, you know, this is our time and, and I'm excited about what we can do to really shake up and continue to disrupt industries that never considered us in the first place. Yeah. And, and you know, and that's a, that's a hard thing to um, walk into rooms uh, where there are people who don't even want you there, who don't even think that you deserve to, to be there. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty hard move to make. I'm just going to, I'm just going to be real about it. So with everything that we face that's going on in corporate America, we talked about racism, right? We talked about, we just talked about um, securing a seat at the table. And I love how you say that securing a seat starts in the mind first. Like everything starts within, right? It has to start within first. But even with that being said though, um, Amanda, how do we even know it's even worth the fight to go through all of that to secure a seat at the table so we can exemplify, you know, what black women or women of color look like and that we're smart and things like that. And even, you know, create a space for the next woman. Like, how do we even know that's even worth the fight? Yeah. And I think that's part of like understanding that we have choices. Right. And I think sometimes we've always thought, well, we just have to take this. Right. We just have to do this. But what would it look like if you tell yourself a new story, the one that um, maybe they don't want me in this room, but is this adding to my bottom line, right? Is this adding to my short-term, long-term career goals? Like thinking about our why, right? Not just taking a, taking a seat just to say we work at X company, but is that really adding value to our lives and our goals? And I think that, that that's the point too. But also, Lakeisha, I think it's important, you, you made a very good point, is not every room is meant for us. Right. And so often we're, we're actually contributing to the trauma by trying to make it work at these places that are never going to accept us. And just like any relationship, um, you got to know when to fold them. Right. If it's not serving you, <laughs> if everything is a battle, um, then know that you belong in every space, but not every space deserves to have you. And, and finding that healing so that you can see yourself in a different way and find those places that are going to welcome you, right? No workplace is, is perfect, just like no, any relationship isn't perfect, but you know when you're being mistreated, right? <clears throat> you know when people want you there or not. And I just don't think that that's just compounding the trauma when we keep trying to get people to like us and keep, get people to accept us. Like, 
no sis, take that, get what you need, make work, work for you while you're there. But think about how do you want to live the rest of your life, right? Do you really want to fight this battle every single day? Uh, or do you want to find those places that are looking for you, right? And, and I think that that's the thing, like sometimes we're so in these trenches of these toxic work environments that we've told ourselves this is as good as it's going to get, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't allow ourselves to, to know that there's better for us. And, and I think once we own that and realize that, then, you know, we can really step into our power even more. Oh my God. I love that you, I love that you said that, you know, that we create the trauma by trying to be in rooms that's not for us. If, if that's you, I'm going to need you to take a look at your personal life. Because let's talk about purpose for, for a hot second. People say all the time, Minda, that they're trying to find a purpose. I truly believe that you don't have to find it. You know what it is. You just need to embrace it. It's just that our life experiences, you know, it molds us and it also blocks our view. You know, when you go through different traumatic experiences or whatever, it pulls you further and further away from purpose right so your vision gets a little blurry is there it's always been there and it's not going to go anywhere so when we go through all of this trauma and it's unresolved what we tend to find ourselves trying to do be validated yep, yep. find people to confirm us right and so we get into these relationships you know rather good or bad because we just want somebody to validate us and the reason why most people you know who have who have identified their purpose, why they don't operate, it's because purpose sets you apart from everybody else, which is a good thing. But because we have this unresolved trauma, we don't want to be set apart. We want to be like everybody else, right? <laughs> we want to feel, quote unquote, I'm doing air quotes, you guys, normal. But it's just like being different is good, right? We were all meant to be different for a reason. So if you are battling, you know, validation in your own life, you know, where you just want somebody to confirm, you just want somebody to validate, you just want somebody to love you and you constantly putting yourself in these, you know, um, negative situations, of course, you're going to be trying to go into rooms that, that you don't belong in at work. Of course, because it's this is right now. Yeah, that, that was a word that you just spoke. I said, get the tambourine. <laughs> for the podcast <laughs> but but you know this is this is this is great because people set goals at the top of the year resolutions you know they create vision boards and all these things and they have these wonderful goals right but they don't take into consideration how everything is interconnected you know they have this goal of you know making six figures but maybe you're not getting promoted because you're not even putting yourselves in the right position to get promoted right so everything is interconnected how you showing up in your personal life would definitely affect how you show up at at work and so that's why we're talking about it that's why we're talking about it at the top of the year because with everything that we experienced last year in 2020 child we need to talk about it <laughs> we we, we got to open up the dialogue because i think too as black women we think we have to be strong for everybody right we that we can't be vulnerable in, in certain spaces and acknowledge that we have been harmed, right? We have experienced this. And, and the only way that we can move forward and heal is if we acknowledge that what good could look like for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. And, you know, considering that we are still in a, in a, in a pandemic, right? We, we're still in it. So finances are, are huge. Um, right now, a lot of people were furloughed, a lot of people were laid off uh, last year. So it's it's just been crazy. But on the flip side, Minda, I've had friends who landed six-figure jobs during the pandemic as well. So yeah, there were companies that were laying out, but there was also businesses that were booming, you know, um, in, in 2020 because of the, the pandemic. But let's talk to the people who um, don't want to negotiate, right? or renegotiate, because you talked a lot about that in, in the memo, because we as women, I think as a women, I think it's just a, a female thing in general, no matter what race you are, 
we don't like to negotiate or we just too scared to negotiate when it comes to to money and and salary should we use the pandemic as an excuse not to negotiate or renegotiate our salaries absolutely not right you you still doing the work they still expect you to show up and do the work <laughs> they, they, they're still if you if you're employed right now um or even if you're not your skill set is still your skill set right? Um, and you are still a value add, you are still the asset. And so I, I really um, hate when I hear women say, well, you know, I'm not going to ask for anything. Uh, I had a good friend I was talking to, and she got a new job. And she's like, you know, I, I know we're going to have that salary conversation, but maybe I should just go with whatever they say. And I said, you just got done uh, investing in yourself in a certification program so that they could, so that you could get an, a, a better job. I said, so why would you sell yourself short, right? It goes back to knowing that you deserve this, right? And why wouldn't you ask for what you need, right? Or ask for what you're worth. And I think that we talk ourselves out of things, right? It's not for you to decide that the answer, you, the part of the equation that you can solve is what you do. Then you wait to see what they do, right? But don't go in from the gate saying, well, it says the range is 35 to you know 65 or 75 to 120. I'll just ask for the 75 because that was more than I was making before. No, you know, I've worked with people who, <laughs> who had less experience making more money than me, right? And so again, the part of the equation that we can solve is what we do and what we ask for. Because if you say that you wanna make six figures or you wanna make seven figures, it's going to require some negotiation. I don't know anybody, including myself, that got to some of those numbers not negotiating, just waiting for somebody to be like, hey, Minda, we got, we got a six-figure check for you. No, I had to ask for what I needed, right? And if they're not able to do that, then I had to say, okay, what else can I ask for? What are the fringe benefits that make this worth it for me, right? And so um, I just to your, just like you said, I have friends, people I don't even know who have secured their seat and secured their bag in COVID. I heard somebody say a COVID come up. There's been a lot of black women who have had a COVID come up. So allow yourself <laughs> to harness that energy and, and ask for what you want. I, again, um, scared money don't make money, uh, as they say. <laughs> Man, I love that. Scare money don't, don't make money. I, I love that. But you know what? The, the, the scariest word, the scariest word for most people is no. Yes. That is the scariest word for a lot of people. And, you know, for me, it was it was a scary word, too, you know, for me for for a long time. But then I had to realize, you know, uh, or just reflect on all the stuff that I, that I've been through. So it's like, if I've been able to overcome everything that I've been through, how scary really is this no? <laughs> like how scary is it really? You know, what's the worst that can happen is that you go in there, you ask and they say, no, it's completely okay. I think we need to redefine how we react to the word to the word no you know it was a uh, one point in time on my social media that I just put up post Minda that just had the word no that's it like several times throughout the day because I'm like y'all need to get to get used to hearing the word no you need to get used to seeing the word no because you're gonna have to get through some no's in order to get to your yes if you never have a no you may never get to your yes you just may not never get to it. And just because, you know, somebody tells you, you know, that has nothing to do with your worth. That doesn't mean that you're not, you know, valid. It doesn't mean that you're not talented. It's, it, it doesn't mean that, you know, you shouldn't have it. You know, we don't know what the meaning is behind, behind that no. You know, you probably need to hear that no in order for you to pivot in another direction. Because maybe you've been at that company for way too long. Yeah, because, yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree with that because no, I, I think that it goes back to the stories that we tell ourselves, right? And sometimes when you hear a certain thing or you don't receive the raise or you don't receive the promotion, then we start to internalize the situation like I wasn't good enough, right? They don't like me. They don't want me. It's like, you don't even know what the reason was. Maybe um, they never, maybe they had somebody else in mind and they were just, checking boxes to interview people right like you don't know what the reason was and now we're telling ourselves that we're not worthy and we're never going to ask again it's just like um 
you go to a restaurant, right? And you've been reading the reviews for so long and you're like, everybody's loving this new hot restaurant when we could eat out and about <laughs> and, and somebody, and then you eat it and it doesn't, you're like, mm, this wasn't that as good, right? You're not gonna then never eat out ever again. Right? You, you never, you're, you're going to find restaurants that suit your palate. Right. And it's just like anything in life. Like it may not be the right fit. It may not taste right. It may not work for you, but it doesn't mean that you're never going to go after. I hope it doesn't mean that you're never going to go after another. Yes. Right. Because as an entrepreneur, um, I've heard so many yeses. I mean, I felt, so when I do hear, I, uh, I, I felt, I heard so many no's. So when you do hear a yes, you're like, you know, but it's, it's a process, right. But to your point, I don't tie my worth to somebody's no, right? And sometimes no means not right now, right? There's, before the memo even, I had, there's five major publishers, four of them said no to the memo because they said that there was not, this, this book would, doesn't have an audience. These things don't happen in the workplace. And if I allowed myself to believe that my experiences and other people that I know you know, but when you let certain people dictate the narrative, right, you would start to think, well, maybe, maybe there isn't an audience, right? But four said no, one said yes. The memo became a best-selling book. But think about how, if I stopped at four, right, and I just packed my toys and left. Right? <laughs> but, but you keep going. And, and I think that that's, we're in a new year, right? You, you're going to get those no's, but keep going till you get yes. And I'm at the best place I could be right? You know, I'm at the best publisher I could be. And when I sold my next books, some of those people who said no to the memo said yes to my next book, you know, so you just never know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, what if you would have stopped at number four? I love that. Uh, you know, when, when you said that, it made me think of James Dyson. You guys know, you heard of the Dyson vacuum cleaner. Yes. Um, I recently um, discovered James Dyson um, a few years ago and realized that with the Dyson vacuum cleaner, he had 5,127 failed prototypes. I'm going to say that again for you guys. 5,127 failed prototypes before he perfected the Dyson vacuum cleaner. And I know what y'all thinking, Keisha, how you remember that number? Because who goes through 5,127 failed anything like I mean, what if he would have stopped at four he I'm, I'm I think he's married I think he's married you know his wife probably looked at him crazy at the 10th failed prototype how many times people talked about him when he fell 1500 times like that is correct that is mind-boggling to me that he went 5,127 different times. We don't even give ourselves a second chance. And this man, <laughs> and this man gave him five, gave himself 5,127 different chances. And we won't even give ourselves a second chance, right? Yep. So what if Minda would have stopped at four? We wouldn't even be having this conversation right now, you know? So I, I'm glad that I'm glad you didn't stop. And I really want you guys to um, really sit on that and, and think about that and meditate on that for a second. Because even with Kevin Hart, his book, his book is on um, Audible as, as well, his first book that he wrote. And when I listened to his book, I had a newfound respect for, for Kevin. Cause to me, Kevin was overnight success. He came out of nowhere until I read his book. This man had been doing comedy for like 20 years. He had a failed TV show. He was in financial debt. He said, right in his book, he said, right now, American Express won't give him a car. And how much is he worth? American Express won't even give him a car because of his financial woes back when he was, you know, on the come up. It take years. So it took this man 20 years to become the Kevin that we know today. Yeah. What if he would have stopped at the six month mark? <laughs> what? I mean, you guys, it, it takes it takes time and we need to practice patience. And I say we, we need to practice patience because that's something that I'm, you know, working on. That's something I'm working on as, as well. You know, we have to, we have to protect those nose and, and like Minda said, not attach our worth to those nose. Cause they gonna come. 
they, that's life. Right? <laughs> that is part of the life cycle. Um, but continue to bet on yourself because, you know, even on the times I've betted on myself and I did get those no's, I never regret it because again, I, I look at life so much differently and it's part of the equation I can solve. I can't make somebody say yes to me, but I can say, you know what, Minda, I'm glad we tried, right? <laughs> I'm glad we gave it our best shot, you know, um, and, and sometimes, and that helps for the next shot, right? Just like an athlete, right? They're not going to make it. You think about Serena Williams, right? She keeps playing. She doesn't win every Wimbledon. She doesn't win every U.S. Open, right? But she's still one of the best athletes uh, in the world, right? And so um, those no's are going to come even you know, uh, all of us experience them. That's part of human being a human. Yeah, everybody, everybody experience experience a, a no. And you know, and even with Serena Williams, even though she hasn't won every tennis match, that hasn't damned her shine in our eyes. We still think Serena is a beast when it comes to to tennis, playing tennis. Like what? She still is. <laughs> she still is. Yeah. And she hasn't won. She hasn't won every. She hasn't won every game. You know. But yeah. we still consider her, we still consider her uh, a beast. But you guys, you have to get to a point where you're advocating for yourself on a personal level so you can do the same thing and, you know, so you can do the same thing in, in corporate America. But, uh, you know, Mindy, we talked a lot about um, securing a seat at the table, you know, and helping those who's coming behind us. So what? I'm, I'm going to take a personal moment to get your professional opinion because what I plan to do in 2021 is to pivot my business to corporate where I go into corporations to help them to infuse self-awareness in their corporate culture, right? Because um, like I said earlier, I want to, you know, erase that the divide between who we are at home and who we are at work because we, we're only one person right? We, we don't clone ourselves um, when we go into different environments. And I think if corporations have a culture that promotes authenticity, like for real, for real, promote authenticity, where people can really come in and be who they are, you know, and, and when I say be who they are, if you're an ass, don't be an ass at, at work, because nobody want to be around you if, you if you're an ass. But what I'm saying is coming to, um, a, a culture where you can utilize all your skills and and talents right so if you are a passionate person you can bring that passion to the workplace and it's not looked upon as a negative thing if you're a black woman your passion doesn't automatically turn into anger like no i'm, I'm just passionate about what it is that what it is that i do so in your opinion, do you think Black women and women of color would be more apt to advocate for themselves in a working environment if they were allowed to just be who they are? Yes, 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 yes. I, and, and I think that's why oftentimes we question ourselves so much because the environment in which we work says, you're not part of the status quo, right? And so if we change uh, the environment, we change the culture and to your point, provide self-awareness because the reality is most people in the dominant majority that tends to be white in the workplace, they're not thinking about if I can bring, if Minda or Lakeisha can bring her full self to work, you know, they're not concerned about us, right? They don't even, they don't even look at us in those ways of like, is that even, you know, that's just, that's just her, you know what I mean? Like, but they look at everybody else through different dimensions, through different lenses, right? Like mm -hmm. we are multidimensional and we want to be able to bring that and we want to be able to speak up in a meeting without receiving backlash. And I think that it's partially why I wrote the memo is because I wanted white people to realize that it's not just about you, right? Other people are in these environments, right? And just like, you don't like when someone disrespects you in the workplace, Mm -hmm. We don't want that either, right? This is a this isn't a black issue. This isn't a white issue. This is a humanity issue. How do we make the workplace work for everybody? And that means that you have to know what it's like for me to walk in. You can't call yourself an ally if you don't know anything about me. <laughs> right? you, you, that's not enough, right? So I, I do believe that the it's not that certain companies are bad. It's it's that people have toxic behaviors. And they need to be aware of those. And so I'm really excited for you to let people know that it's not just the bottom line. If 
people feel like they can bring those pieces of themselves and are aware of how their how their authentic pieces are harming other people or encouraging other people it can be good and bad then i think we'll be more productive right because as a black woman in the workplace i spent so much of my time wondering what my colleagues were thinking about what I just did or what I just said. I can't be pr as productive as I need to be in this toxic environment, right? I need Jim or Sally to be more self-aware so that we can be together, be more pr productive. And so I do think that that's important and, and corporate America is going to have to take, going to have to redefine success and it's going to start with being self-aware. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know, I, I love in in <laughs> in the book because you 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 don't hold back in that in that book because you talk to Jane and Sally and you tell them it ain't all about you, Jane. <laughs> I was like, come through, Minda. <laughs> come through. Like we have to be we we have to be aware that other people are are there, and and regardless of of what you what you think, you know, you're not the only person that's making this world go around. People that only look like you, it's not just the only people who are, who's making this world go around. I don't care what you say, you know, because it's just crazy to me how black people are such a small, uh, you know, portion of the population, which I debate that, but we spend trillions of dollars <laughs> in certain industries. Like our buying power is ridiculous, but our savings account is ridiculous as well. Our savings accounts don't even match up to our to our buying power, which is just like crazy, which is crazy to me. So it's like, yes, you need to be aware that there's other people in your working environment and that is it's not all about you. And you also talk a lot about um, being a people person in your book as well, which I thought was was really good. So can you break down the difference between being a people person? and a people pleaser. Yeah, you know, you said something uh, back um, at the top of our time speaking and mm -hmm. it's, yes, these environments that we've been working in, many of them are toxic, no doubt, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, but there's another side of the story and that's who we are as black women when we show up into these spaces and what we do or what we don't do. Mm -hmm. And, um, Part of that is, you know, I have so many Black women who will say, well, I don't want to go to the networking events. I'm not going to the virtual events. I'm not doing all of these different things. And, and part of this is building relationships, right? And so for me, I am naturally an introvert, but I knew that me keeping my head down or never turning on, you know, if you're in a virtual environment, never turning on your video, people are not going to get to know you in the ways to think of you for, for opportunities if they don't know what you're about, right? And so for me, it wasn't about pleasing my colleagues after a while, it was about, this is part of my career. I'm not gonna leave it up to chance and luck for things to start to happen for me, right? Um, and so I think being a people pleaser does not get you very far because that leaves your cup empty, right? When we talk about love languages, if you're always doing the loving and nobody's ever getting to know you and knowing how to fill your cup, then you're always gonna come up short just like the workplace, right? You're doing all the things, saying yes to all the things, but your manager never thinks of you, you know? So you got to think about those things. And that's being a people pleaser and not receiving what you need. Uh, Lauren said, um, talks about reciprocity, Lauren Hill in one of her, her, her songs. And it's like, where is that reciprocity, right? And I think that that's what, that's what being a people person is. You're building relationships so that it benefits you too. Right. And so when we look about look at who, you know, I talk about it in the book, building your squad in the workplace, it's not so that you can be everybody's best friend forever. It's no, when certain things come about, and you're not in those rooms, who's speaking your name? Right. <laughs> and in those sorts of things. So, you know, don't think about, oh, I, I'm not that type of person. I'm not going to kiss anybody's butt. Nobody's asking you to do that. What, what we are asking you to do is be strategic with who you're building relationships with so that it benefits you right? Because you don't want to be at some company for 20 years and no one ever thinks of you, you know? And you may be like dope as heck, right? You may have all the things, but if people don't know that about you, then you're sitting wondering, well, why is Kevin getting promoted? You know what? Kevin was at the virtual bingo. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> so just, we have to think if you want something different this year, it will require you to move different too. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I I love that, you know, and I love how you how you broke it down in in the book, the memo, the memo as as well. But and and again, this goes back to how you are in your personal life as well, because you know, business relationships are just as important as you know personal relationships. But when it comes to relationships, a lot of us, especially women, we have this scarcity mindset. Now, when you hear people say, you know, um, the phrase scarcity mindset or don't have a scarcity mindset, we automatically just think about money, right? Um, We think about wealth, but I truly believe that you can apply that to also people. People are a resource, you guys. And we have, you know, the scarcity mindset when it comes to relationships that we just want our best friend, our mama and our auntie, and that's it. And it's just like, that, that cannot be your only you know, your only squad. Now, if you have a, a, a support system of 20 people, that doesn't mean that all 20 people are your best friends. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that. It's mean, what is your system? Who, who supports you on your journey, on your self-awareness journey, right? Like who's supporting you while you're in the workplace that's keeping you in focus on your goals and what you're there to do. And like Minda said, who's, you know, speaking your name in rooms that you're not even sitting in? Who's bringing you up? Who's thinking about you? That's not to say that, like she said, that you're kissing butt, it's you literally building your support team. And this is something that I teach you how to do in my Master Life class, Strategize Your Vision. And which is why we're talking about it doing this Strategize Your Vision series, because relationship building is important. And we need to think beyond our parents and beyond our best friend when it comes to building relationships. Like who's your mentor? Who's your mentee? Who's helping you to you know, stay fit? not just physically, but mentally, right? Like your therapist should be a part of your support team. Like what are these relationships that that you're building, right? So if if people are not building relationships in their personal lives, then yeah, no, they're not doing the virtual bingo at work. That part. even doing the the virtual the virtual bingo at work and it's you know it's okay to you know to get to know people and to allow people to get to know you too um because when you said that it it made me think you know because uh, I don't want to say uh, okay, this is this probably gonna be, this probably gonna be a little bit controversial, but a lot of white people don't really have a lot of interaction with black people or people that don't look like them. And I'm not saying that it's our job, but why not show up and be you so they can have exposure? I mean, there's there's nothing wrong with that. At least I don't think so. It's no different from you traveling the world and going to different, you know, museums or whatever to, for you to get exposure to other cultures, right? It's not, it's not different from you putting yourself in different circumstances to get exposure. Like, yeah, they should do that on their, on their own. But if we're not in the room, they can go to as many different events as they want to. But if we are not present and we are not doing our part by showing up, how are they ever going to get that exposure? It's a two-way street, you guys. It's a two-way street. And that's the thing, right? Like if you work with uh, at a place that has, um, you know, the, the online networking or whatever people are doing, you know, white people, they go to those things, right? And And they get seen and they're doing the thing. And then oftentimes you know, we aren't doing those things because we're like, that's, I don't have to do all that. I don't want to do all that. And that's true. You will always have a choice, right? (laughs) But the reality is we still work in a system where social capital is very important. And if people don't see your face, they don't think about you. They don't even know what you're working on because you've never articulated to, you know, that. And you don't, again, you don't have to be the life of the party in the Zoom room, but you could also say, hey, I noticed there were three people that were at virtual bingo, let me write down their names and then reach out to somebody and, you know, schedule a 15 minute coffee, right? Now you're building out your network, right? Hey, I saw you at virtual bingo, you know, would love to, you know, follow up, uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, 
think about how this works for you because now you have expanded your network. Now, if, if something, God forbid, something were to happen in your department and this person is hiring, they might actually remember that coffee that you had, virtual coffee, and say, you know what? Minda mentioned that she was interested in IT. Let me circle back with her, right? But that might have never happened had we not, you know, been at bingo. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Man, I just had, uh, I lost my thought. It was something that you said and I lost my thoughts just that quick. Uh, and it was good too. It was good too, but I think it, what was it? I hate it. I hate it when, I hate it when that happens. I, I had a train of thought based off of something you said. I can't remember what it is. Ah, and that's going to bug me for the rest of the day. It's going to pop up later on. It's going to pop up later on today. That's why I like to write stuff down because I be, because the thoughts can be um, fleeting sometimes. Hmm. What was it? Give me a second. What was it? Yeah, I lost my train of thought just that quick. I don't know. It's going to, it's going to, uh, it probably come back to me later. I just put it in the, I put it in the intro and the outro or something. Dang it. Man, <laughs> I hate, I hate that. But um, this has been amazing. I could talk to you all day long. You're a great, a great uh, host, um, and you're easy to talk to. So thank you. Oh, thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Oh, I, I know, I know what I wanted to say. So you guys, with with building relationships, if you're too afraid to, like Minda said, to um, reach out and say, "Hey, I saw you at Virtual Bingo. You know, let's go have coffee." If if that's too scary for you, practice it in your personal life first. Maybe go knock on the neighbor's door. You know, because literally like what you do in your personal life, it would easily transition into your, into your, your work life. I promise you it will. And during this conversation, if you haven't already, you know, got the hint (laughs) that what goes on at home, you know, affects work and and vice versa. If you haven't gotten that hit already. Okay. I'm just gonna have to knock you upside your head, but please understand. So whatever it is that you want to do you know, to help to advance your career, practice that in your, in your personal life. I know a lot of people out there are introverts, you know, who don't like to, to talk, who don't like to be seen. But like Minda said, you don't have to be the life of the party. You just need to be in the room. Talk to, you know, the few people that's right around you. You know, when you walk into a room, you know, set your eyes on like five people. Okay. I'm just going to talk to these five people, whatever, and make those conversations meaningful. You know, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's all it takes. And if you are, like I said, if you're too scared, whatever it is that you want to do professionally, practice it personally first. So you can build up um, the courage to do it in your, in your professional life. So that's what I, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Perfect. I'm glad it came back. But Minda, yes, I could talk to you all day my friend, I could talk to you all day, but I want to be respectful of your time. But before I let you go, please give us an audible book or a book recommendation of a book that you have read or listened to that has, you know, inspired you on any level. The book that I want to let you know, because we talked about money today, is called Ask for More by Alex Carter. I think she goes by Alexandra Carter, but great book. She is like an expert in negotiation and salary for women. So ask for more. Okay, last question. When describing the meaning of living your truth, complete this phrase. I'm gonna give you two words and you tell me what your third word is. So those words are self-awareness, purpose, and self-love. I love that. Self-love. I love that. You know, self-love is, is a great word to really describe this whole conversation because what it all boils down to is, is, is self-love. You know, how are you loving on yourself? You know, we talked about trauma, uh, resolving trauma. That's a form of self-love. Advocating for yourself, that's a form of self-love. 
you know, your friend you, you talked about who didn't want to negotiate, renegotiate her salary, you renegotiate your salary, sis. It's a formal step love. <laughs> yes. And she got what she wanted. So <laughs> close mouths don't get fed. So congratulations to, to your friend. Congratulations to her. But Minda, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for saying yes to this conversation. It was uh, amazing. And I think having this conversation at the top of the year after such a you know tumultuous year, I know that this is going to set some people free and this is going to give them the courage that they need to walk into that office and ask for what they want, regardless of the economy and the situation. Absolutely. And thank you for having me. You're welcome. I need every one of you to share your thoughts and add your two cents to this conversation over on social media. Make sure to tag me at Lakeisha Woodard and make sure to tag Minda at Minda Hearts. We want to definitely hear from you because I'm 100% positive that we got your gears turning, especially around the interconnection of our personal and professional life. We have an opportunity here to make a shift in the environments where we live and where we work, not only for our benefit, but for the benefit of the women coming behind us. We're all obligated to make the environments we frequent better than what they were before we got there. That's how change is not only made, but it's forever lasting. And for some of you, I know this is easier said than done because maybe your fate was depleted. Okay, due to everything that's going on. And that's understandable. All right. It's, it's understandable to lose a little hope. Hell, we're all imperfect humans, right? It's going to happen. We're going to lose hope. But the good news is that each day brings new opportunities to regain the hope that we lost. And next week, we're going to talk more about it. So family, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my podcast every single week. If you need help creating a strategy for having an ambitious career without sacrificing your personal commitment, then head on over to strategizeyourvision.com to enroll in class today because the doors are officially open. Also note that all Audible recommendations given on any episode are linked in the show notes. You can try Audible for free. Please remember to leave a five-star rating and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Also, don't forget to click the join community link that's in the show notes so we can stay connected. As you know, I said a lot to go to touch one million hearts within the first two years of the podcast, and I can only do it with your help. So please remember to download each episode, share the conversation with at least four people that you know, and repost on your favorite social media platform. Well, family, I appreciate you. My heart is filled with so much gratitude. And until next time, always remember that you are enough and your truth is beautiful.